Thanks for joining us on FinPod and our latest edition of What's New at CFI, where we bring you insights from our latest courses and behind the scenes conversations with subject matter experts. Get ahead and stay ahead with the latest from CFI. Hello and welcome to the What's New at CFI podcast. I'm Asim Khan and I'm joined today by my colleague Noah Miller, who is CFI's resident expert on all things ESG. Noah, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me. Excited to be here. Well, it's always great to have you. And uh, our subject for today is the course that you published on ESG risk management. I had a chance to go through it recently. It's it's super informative. And I guess the first question I have, you know, someone who's coming at this from a, a, a novice's point of view where ESG is concerned is, it seems ESG is ubiquitous these days. Is this something that I'm late to catch up on or has, has this been going on for a while? Yeah, well, uh, ESG risks have certainly been manifesting for a while. Have we been addressing them? That's a good question. Um, ESG has been around for a while in terms of uh, its evolution from environmental health and safety and then to corporate sustainability, to social responsibility. And now we're in the age of ESG, where it's really framed as a management framework for managing the risks and opportunities of the changing environment right? Changing uh, societal expectations and stakeholder needs and what that requires of companies to manage those changes. So it's been going on, but now it has become, uh, you know, from the fringes into the mainstream as a uh, business concept and a management framework. Okay. So let's, let's go to the very fundamentals and I mean basics. So what is E, what is S and what is G? Great question. Uh, e stands for environmental. So that refers to how a company uh, manages their impact on the environment and use of natural resources. S, uh, social, so social issues. And it really comes down to how do you engage and create value for your stakeholders, right? For your customers, your employees, your suppliers, uh, your vendors, your employees, et cetera. And then G, governance, right? How is a company managed and led the policies and protocols that uh, reflect the company's leadership? So that's the that's the quick and dirty of what are these acronyms, and together they comprise ESG. Okay, and, and what are some of the um, let's let's talk about headline ESG risks. So if you could give us a couple of examples of maybe large corporates that um, uh, mismanaged that risk and, mm -hmm. and suffered some sort of consequence for it, or and and, cons and conversely, tell us perhaps some some folks who've done it right you know, and have, uh, have, have not paid the price. So, um, so go ahead. I'll, I'll leave that, I'll leave that to you. You must have some choice examples. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, this isn't necessarily corporate, but I think it's just the most recent really big example of climate risk is, you know, the destruction in Hawaii in the, in, in America in the, you know, $11 billion of damage from wildfires that ultimately come down to climate risk. That's a bad example of not not addressing the uh, long term risk of climate change. Uh, in terms of uh, social issues like labor management, I mean, you think of uh, UPS, the UPS uh, labor strikes that costed them something like you know something in the eight to ten billion for a week and a half of no operations because of the labor strikes. So you see that these are very expensive risks to not manage. Um, some other really famous examples of governance blunders are, you know, Wells Fargo over the years, where aggressive sales tactics, lack of controls and oversight, you know, um, all of the reasons why they're getting dinged in regulator fines over and over again. That comes down to a very good manifestation of poor governance practices. Um, so folks that are doing it right, I, I'm, I hate to say that I haven't seen a lot of great examples of folks doing it right. But I do believe that companies are starting to recognize that these are very expensive risks to ignore. Um, you think of uh, other transition climate risks, things like Goldman Sachs has gotten fined by regulators for not following their own ESG policies around energy investing. Um, the DWS chief of Deutsche Bank, right? His office was raided by the SWAT team, something like 30 million in remediation costs uh, to the regulators. So you have all these examples of if these risks really go ignored, they are incredibly expensive for the company and reputationally just uh, incredibly damaging to the people behind it. I, I think uh, what I'm getting from all this is, and I may be wrong, is that 
um, we're going from what was once a unipolar corporate world where all the power, say, was with the corporation, and it's now being devolved to uh, employees, communities, regulators, other stakeholders in the activities of the corporation. Is that, am I kind of... Close? I think that's a very fair statement for sure, right? And after the, you know, post-COVID world where the, you know, the great resignation, the talent wars, exactly like you said, more and more employees felt empowered to be able to make these choices of, you know, I'm not going to work for places that don't, you know, provide the welfare that we expect. Um and you saw things like the auto strikes, right? The United Auto Worker strikes that costed many auto workers tremendous amounts of money from that production downtime. So you're absolutely right. Um, the power dynamics are really shifting, and there is this groundswell of employees are going to be your loudest critics or your greatest fans, and it really depends on right how you engage and create value with them. And and um, on on a, on a basis that's a bit more removed from that i saw something recently in the news where large investors weren't weren't investing in the equities of certain companies that didn't have strict esg protocols or maybe weren't the best at following esg protocols we we see that as well on what we call the buy side of the investment world yes for sure for sure um there you know it's becoming more and more common practice that ESG due diligence criteria are becoming, you know, central to a a uh, investment thesis or a loan allocation or the credit terms. And we're we at Row Impact do a lot of that work, so we're seeing it in real time in the way that companies that used to be a little bit more uh, boutique or, you know, considered more progressive, were the ones doing this. But now it's becoming a mainstream expectation to you know, satisfy your own stakeholder requirements um, as a finance lead, as well as, you know, the folks that are asking for for funding. So, I mean, it's it's plausible, or maybe it's already happened that somebody like Blackstone says, yeah, we like this stock, but the ESG protocols aren't exactly where they should be. So these pr pr present unknown risks to our uh, potential stockholding. So therefore we can't invest or we could pending some sort of um, uh, rehabilitation of the ESG protocols. Right, right. That's typically how we've we've seen, uh, and I have seen in my experience, how companies are, or investors, financiers are interacting with companies is, you, you don't meet our criteria. We like everything else. So we're going to provide an action plan for you in terms of what expectations we have for you to meet in order to continue, you know, working with us. Um, so it's definitely some spectrum of, hard we're not working with you unless you meet these criteria today but it's definitely getting to the getting to the point where even if you're a small vendor to some of these companies you still have to be able to show your receipts for doing this work and that you can provide that data and i suppose this has given rise to sort of a cottage industry around uh auditing or verifying esg scores for companies for sure for sure i'd say the you know the esg rating game which is going through its own crazy evolution in regulatory tightening. Um, there is a lot of business out there around chasing those points and advancing those scores because of those decisions you just mentioned and being able to, you know, essentially paint the clearest picture, the best picture for a, in, uh, for a financer around what you're doing. So there is this emerging ESG rating advancement world. Um, now, is that helping everyone? That's another podcast topic, I think. But um, it's certainly informing the decision making of the folks doling out the the capital. Right. Okay. And uh, one bit about the, uh, your your course I enjoyed was some of the uh, amused by some of the language. There's new terminology that's developed um, around a serious subject. Things like the say to do ratio. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, social license to operate. Say to do is basically, if I could paraphrase, it's it's put your money where your mouth is. Right. Very well said. <laughs> yes. Yes. Exactly right. And and it's that right. It's that say do ratio. If it's not tight in terms of those big public statements and then those big actions that show you're doing what you say you're doing, that is the greenwashing alarm bells going off for you know the broader public, your stakeholders. So yeah, that's right. Put your money where your mouth is, or you could be in you know hot water. Right. And um, here's one thing, one question that came to my mind because so a lot of our um, learners at CFI are not only practicing professionals, but they're also aspiring professionals. Okay, so if you have um, a university student, for instance, 
who's interested in a career in ESG. Um, what are some, and how do you, how do you find your way into this area of the profession? Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, up until recently, there was a huge ESG hiring boom uh, just across the board. I think statistically, or at least the headlines are saying it slowed down a bit. Um, but ultimately, I think it's really, you know, how do you get in? Um, it's becoming how you get in with any other job at this point. I think it's the, fo you know, you got to network to get work, as they say. And um from my experience, HR leaders are still getting familiar with what exactly are the capabilities and in, in skill sets and academic background that would fit this role. Um, so that is one inherent challenge. But I think folks that are able to essentially break down these topics and speak to them in a digestible way, essentially getting away from the you know more abstract, more fluff, more val you know values, philosophical underpinnings. I think those are the folks that are going to have a lot more success getting in there because at the end of the day. ESG is about effective management. It's not about your personal value system. So not I think it. it's folks that are able to make that connection and really speak to it clearly, regardless of where, you know, where they want to end up in a company are going to be the ones that will, you know, get, get those roles. Um, Cause they're going to need to be able to speak the commercial language to be able to move those things forward internally anyway. No, got it. That's great. And by your lights, this is, not a flash in the pan. It's not today's trend. ESG is here to stay. There's a trajectory here. Absolutely. Absolutely. The name may change, but we're still going to have crazy amounts of storms and flooding and wildfires. People are still going to need to be treated with respect and dignity and a living wage. Hmm. And it's still going to require uh, management teams to address these range of competing both business priorities and stakeholder expectations, regardless of what we call it. So I hope uh, it's just a, it's just good business is what we're calling it soon. Excellent. And with that, I thank you so much for your time and your insights, Noah, and we look forward to seeing you again. Thanks for having me. Always a pleasure. Thanks for joining us today. We hope you enjoyed the conversation. FinPod is brought to you by Corporate Finance Institute, the number one rated online provider of finance and banking training, certifications, and productivity tools.